Praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Friends, I decided to put together some notes on the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass based on the confluence of three principal events. Number one, my having completed Facilitating Fulfilled, a Bible study on uncovering the biblical foundations of Catholicism. Number two, my having completed a block of the diaconate formation instruction on the liturgy and having read several books and publications on the Mass. And number three, my having read that if you don't understand the Mass, you simply don't understand Catholicism. Unless otherwise noted, much of my information comes from the Roman Catholic Sunday Missal, 1962, and Sacred Signs by Servant of God, Monsignor Romano Guardini, who, is an, who was an Italian-German theologian who uh, exercised significant influence on both Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI and Pope Francis. I've decided to break this talk into two parts. The first part is on the Mass per se, where I use a question and answer format similar to what you see in the compendium to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And the second part is on sign, gestures, and other faith components. Before I go further, however, I like to say what this is and what this is not. This is just a list of notes, no real rhyme of reason other than it's all on the Mass, and based on questions I've been asked that I thought you find enlightening. This is not a biblical walk on the Mass or any such thing. Please note how much symbology and purpose is in so much of what Holy Mother Church does. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to start out with the following. At a Mass with incense, how does the holy sacrifice of the Mass begin? In the heresy of formlessness, the Roman liturgy and its enemy by Martin Mosbach, he writes that the priest, accompanied by the incense and candles that betoken the presence of Christ, the King, has approached the altar as a second Christ as Christ entering into the city of Jerusalem. He has incensed the altar as the body of the dead Christ was treated with spices, thus showing that the altar is Christ. Isn't this beautiful? In addition to this, we know incense is symbolic of our praise rising to heaven. But did you know incense represents grace and the effects of grace? Christ was filled with grace as with a sweet fragrance, and of his fullness, we have all received. From Christ, it spreads to the faithful by the work of his ministers. Thus, after the altar, which represents Christ, has been incensed on every side, then all are incensed in the proper order. And I'm sure you may remember this when a beacon comes down and incenses the congregation. And doesn't this remind you also of Eucharistic adoration when the celebrant during benediction intones, you have given them bread from heaven and we respond, having within it, within it all sweetness. Number two, why do we strike our breasts during the penitential act? The striking of the breast means that the heart concealed within is the cause of sin and deserving, therefore, to be punished, bruised, and humbled. The insolent pride of the sinful heart is to be broken and destroyed in order that God may create a new, clean heart within us. Indeed, Monsignor Romano Guardini says, we should beat our breasts with our closed fists. To strike the bre breast is to beat against the gates of our inner world in order to shatter them. This is its significance. And let's remember this, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a man. And this is from Matthew 15, 18. 
Number three, many people use ACTS, A-C-T-S, as a mnemonic for remembering the four types of prayers, adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, and supplication, or as some of us call it, sup, uh, sup, uh, petition. But did you know these are the four ends of the sacrifice of the Mass? And that they're included in that, in that most beautiful and ancient Gloria, which goes back to the third century that we sing on Sundays outside of Advent and Lent. We pray for our adoration when we say, Glory to God in the highest. For Thanksgiving when we say, We give you thanks for your great glory. For contrition when we say, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. And for supplication, when we say, receive our prayer. Any wonder the Mass is the highest form of prayer? Four, how much attention do we pay to the collect, not collect, but collect, which follows the Gloria by the priest intoning, let us pray, or oremus, concludes the introductory rites and precedes the liturgy of the Eucharist, excuse me, the liturgy of the Word. Did you know they're also rich in the doctrine of the church and teach us how to speak to God, urging us always to plead not of our own merits, but to depend rather on the merits of the Lord? Please pay attention also to the preface, and this is something Father Julian, my spiritual director, taught me, which starts the Eucharistic prayer with a celebrant intoning, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God followed by its truly right and just, and concludes with the Sanctus. Sandwiched between it is truly right and just and the Sanctus, you'll read words that speak to the theology of what's been celebrated. And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. And again, uh, uh, this is all because of what Father Julian taught me. During the second week of Advent, I gave a reflection to my diaconate class, and this is my conclusion. During the past two weeks, we've been preparing for our hearts and minds. During the past two weeks, we've been watching and we've been alert. And during the past two weeks, we've been preparing the way so that, as Preface 1 of Advent so beautifully states, when He comes again in glory and majesty, and all is at last made manifest, we who watch for that day may inherit the great promise in which now we dare to hope. Do you think I could have said it better? I don't think so. Why do we curse ourselves before hearing the gospel? One of the more beautiful explanations I've come across says this, the faithful rise and remain standing during the gospel. At the beginning, they make the sign of the cross upon the forehead, lips, and heart to declare that they will never be ashamed of the word of God and that they're ready to confess it by word of mouth, and that they love it with all their heart. Amen. Why does the bishop or priest or deacon kiss the book of the gospel? We see this every single day. Because he is paying homage to the eternal word of God, the second person of the blessed trinity, whose human words are contained therein. What does I believe in one God? the start of a Nicene Creed mean? It means it is binding upon us and involves our whole experience. We take a stand for God against whatever is opposed to Him. And once again, Amen. Do we see all there is to see in the chalice? And again, these are questions I've been asked and that I've asked myself too. The chalice itself represents, represents the three theological virtues. Its base symbolizes our being rooted in faith. Its stem rises upward in hope, like a plant seeking the sun or a soul seeking the heights of heaven. Finally, the cup of the chalice opens like a flower in full bloom, representing the flowering of charity, which we imbibe from the holy sacrifice. Are you getting goosebumps? I am. Absolutely magnificent. What about the sign of peace? The sign of peace prepares us for the actual, or at least the spiritual reception of the sacrament of charity and concord. Saint Cyril of Jerusalem, who lived in the fourth century, tells us 
that it reconciles and unites souls to one another, procuring an entire oblivion of all offenses. It is a sign that minds are again reconciled with one another and that all remembrance of injustice suffered in the past is banished from the heart. Matthew 5, 23, 24 should come to mind, doesn't it? So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Do we realize what we're saying when we say thanks be to God at the end of Mass? We're saying, what return shall we make to the Lord for all that He has given us? We thank our Lord for having become man to suffer and to redeem us when we permit His grace slowly to mold us into a perfect resemblance of Him by the imitation of His offertory in the day to come and for the rest of our lives. Wow! Doesn't this remind us, among other writings, of 2 Peter 1.4, where we read, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion, and, be and become partakers of the, divinity, of the divine nature. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks be to God. I'd like to move on to part two which focuses on signs, gestures, and other faith components. Though these signs, gestures, and other faith components apply to the sacrifice of the Mass, they also apply to some of the things we do outside of the Mass. As with part one, I hope you find this enlightening too. Please note again how much symbology and purpose is involved in so much of what Holy Mother Church does. Unless otherwise noted, Monsignor Romano Guardini is my principal source. The sign of the cross. It is the holiest of all signs. Make a large cross, taking time thinking what you do. Let, let it take in your whole being, body, soul, mind, will, thoughts, feelings, your doing and not doing. And by signing it with the cross, strengthen and consecrate the whole in the strength of Christ. In the name of the triune God. Wow! Kneeling. Let not the bending of our knees be a hurried gesture, an empty form. Put meaning into it. To kneel in the soul's intention is to bow down before God in deepest reverence. To let your whole attitude say, Thou art the great God. It is an act of humility, an act of truth. And every time you kneel, it will do your soul good. Let's resolve here and now to remember this every time we kneel and to remember John 3.30. He must increase, but I must decrease. What about standing? To stand up means that we're in possession of ourselves. Instead of sitting relaxed and at ease, we take hold of ourselves. We stand, as it were, at attention, geared and ready for action. A man on his feet can come or go at once. He can take an order on an instant or carry out an assignment the moment he is shown what is wanted. Standing is the other side of reference toward God. Kneeling is the side of worship in rest and quietness. Standing is the sign of vigilance and action. It is the respect of the servant in attendance, of the soldier on duty. Even when we're praying alone, to pray standing May, may more forcefully express our inward state. What about the doors to the church? This is what Monsignor Guardini says. When you step through the doorway of a church, you are leaving the outer world behind and entering an inner world. The doors have something else to say. Notice how as you cross the threshold, you consciously lift your head and eyes, and how as you survey the interior of the church, there also takes place in you an inward expansion and enlargement. Its great width and height have an analogy to infinity and eternity. A church is a similitude of the heavenly dwelling place of God. Mountains indeed are higher, and the white blue sky outside stretches immeasurably farther. 
But whereas outside space is unconfined, it's unconfined, formless, the portion of space set aside for the church has been formed, fashioned, designed at every point with God in view. The long pillared aisles, the width and solidity of the walls, the high arch and vaulted roofs bring home to us that this is God's house and the seat of his hidden presence. And in the her heresy of formlessness, formlessness, cited in part one, we read, a church that is to house a consecrated host, the blessed sacrament, cannot be banal. How true all this is. Isn't this exactly the way we react when we walk into a truly beautiful church? We freeze in awe and wonder. Think of our own beautiful cathedral. Incidentally, did you know our seven sacraments are known as the doors to the sacred? Please ponder that. Holy water. It is plain why the church uses water as the sign and the bearer of the divine life of grace. We emerge from the waters of baptism into a new life, born again of water and the Holy Spirit. In those same waters, the old man is destroyed and put to death. What about the linen we use? So the linen on the altar in its fine white durableness stands to us both for exquisite cleanliness of heart and for fiber strength. And again, from the heresy of formless, on the corporal, that's the white linen cloth the priest or the deacon unfolds and, and on which the consecrated elements are placed. This corporal was so called because of Corpus Christi, the consecrated host lay upon it. And what can we say about the altar? We can say plenty. This is what the Monsignor offers us. The altar occupies the holy spot in the church. The solid base it is set on is like the human will that knows God, has instituted man for his worship, and is determined to perform that worship faithfully. Absolutely. Weren't we made, aren't we made in his image and likeness? The table of the altar that rests upon this base stands open and accessible for the presentation of the sacrifice. It is not in a dark recess where the actions may be dimly glimpsed, but uncurtained, unscreened. A lever surface in plain sight placed at the heart's altar should be placed, open in the sight of God, without proviso or reservation. In time, though each hour of the day has its own character, three hours stand out from the rest, morning, evening, and halfway between them, noonday, and have an aspect distinctively their own. These three hours the church has consecrated, of them all, the morning hour wears the most shining face each morning we're born again. The morning hour exercises the will, directs the intention, and sets our glaze wholly upon God. The mystery of evening is death. This reminds us of the liturgy of the hours, the second highest form of worship, second only to the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And if you haven't joined us for morning prayer after Mass on Fridays, I urge you in the strongest possible way to join us. I promise you, with the help of the Holy Spirit, you will be transformed. In the name of God, let us, honor, let us honor God's name as we honor God Himself. In reverencing God's name, we reverence also the holiness of our souls. Indeed, the USCCB's, the general instruction of the Roman Missal says that a bow of the head is made when the three divine persons are named together and that the name is of Jesus, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and of the saint in whose honor Mass has been celebrated. So for example, when we say in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we should bow our heads. When we hear the name of Jesus throughout the Mass, for example, during the liturgy of the Eucharist, liturgy of the Word, we should bow our heads. When we hear the name of our Blessed Mother during the Eucharistic prayer, we should bow our heads. And just this past January 5th, we had the memorial of St. John Newman, Every time the priest mentioned the name St. John Newman, we should have bowed our, our head. 
And speaking of bowels, when prevented on occasion by ill health or for reasons of lack of space of the large number of people present or for another reasonable cause, those who don't kneel ought to make a profound bow when the priest genuflects after the consecration. I remember when my wife and I were in the Holy Land on a pilgrimage in 2014 with Sister Albertine Paulus. I'm sure many of you know her. She reminded us, since we were celebrating Mass in the wilderness, that when the priest genuflected after each of the consecrations, we all were supposed to make a profound bow. Obviously, I haven't forgotten that. So, thanks, Sister Albertine. I know you're listening. I'd like to close by leaving you three takeaways. Number one, first and foremost, I hope you found something edifying. I shared all these notes with a Bible study uh, group I facilitate, and they found it, uh, they found useful, they found it useful. My sole purpose has been to share some things I've learned so that we can better fulfill the awesome charge, the Second Vatican Council's Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy gives us. Quote, Mother Church earnestly desires that all faithful should be led to the full, conscious, and active participation in liturgical celebrations, which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy, and to which the Christian people, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a redeemed people, have a right and obligation by reason of their baptism." Unquote. What better way to realize this than to know as much as we can about the holy sacrifice of the Mass, so that we can truly participate more fully, consciously, and actively. Indeed, at the end of Mass, now when we respond, thanks be to God, I'm specially conscious of my response and ask myself, how can I show Him I'm thankful? As imbued with the spirit of the liturgy, 10 Insights from Vatican II's Constitution and the Sacred Liturgy says, not only does exterior participation manifest the faith already present in one's heart, it helps to bring that faith to a deep level. And dare I add the following? That bringing our faith to this deeper level is what we're called to do, to repent, to convert, to transform our hearts what theologians call by the Greek term metanoia. Secondly, there are many things I didn't address for a variety of reasons, and I'll cite but two. The first is that that simply wasn't my stated objective. And the second is that if we were to address everything Holy Mother Church has given us and teaches us, the world itself cannot contain the books that would be written as we read in the last verse of the last chapter of, of, the, of the last gospel, John 21, 25. And finally, I'd like to leave you, uh, the takeaway I'd like to leave you with is on signs. Why signs? Simply put, because our ultimate signs are our seven sacraments, the doors to the sacred, as we mentioned earlier when, when talking about doors. Listen to what the catechism says. The sacraments are efficacious signs of grace, instituted by Christ and entrusted to the Church, by which divine life is dispensed to us. They bear fruit in those who receive them with the required dispositions. And the Catechism goes on to say, the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. The other sacraments, and indeed all ecclesial ministries and works of the Apostles, in other words, Everything anybody does, everything we do, could be adult faith formation, St. Vincent de Paul, Knights of Columbus, women's group, are bound up with the Eucharist and are oriented toward it. Amen. Amen. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen.